Ladies and gentlemen, today I interview Zara Kay, and I hope you guys stay tuned to consider the voice of someone who came out of Islam, who was born and raised in a family who is still practicing Islam. She left Muhammad and Allah and the whole religion behind. Now, she's no longer a believer, but she describes some of the horrible things that happen along the way as she leaves the faith and is starting to be outspoken about the things she once believed. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Stay tuned. Check out my Patreon to get early access to all this material to keep me doing what I'm doing. Love you guys. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been taking a scalpel to the religion of Islam. I want to take a deep dive into the Quran. I want to check out the Hadith. You know, all these claims that uh, a lot of the critics of Islam mention, and a lot of Muslims will try to say or defend, and their apologists come back and forth. But I also talk about deconversion stories and people who've left cults like Scientology, Jehovah's Witnesses, et cetera, et cetera. The list can go on. Christianity is no different, and especially Islam. And today we have Zara Kay joining us, and she's going to tell us a little bit of her story. I'm interested to know more, um, especially when we get into like later on what ends up happening. You guys don't want to miss the uh, jail slash prison arrest of blasphemy. But anyway, uh, I digress. We'll get there. First things first, tell us a little bit about yourself and if there's anything you'd like to plug up front. So when people hear the story, uh, if they want to go and support you, they can go down in the description and check it out. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, definitely agree. Islam is no different to Christianity when it comes to, I guess, if not worse, how they treat um, apostates um, or people who disagree, even Muslims, moderate Muslims who disagree with fundamentalists. Um, my name is Zara and I was, I'm Tanzanian slash Australian now in Europe. Um, I was born in Tanz born and raised in Tanzania, uh, which is not a Muslim country. It is technically a secular country. And this is important because we'll get into it later. Um, hmm. And then I lived um, a lot of my adult teenage life in Australia. So I became Australian um, and then pretty much just traveled around Europe working and um, doing my activism, um, running my charity, Faithless Hijabi, where we have a few different programs, um, one of them being um, our mental health program, where we help ex-Muslims with a lot of the trauma they have from being closeted, working through um, having abandoned their families, but also the repercussions of what happens when you leave religion and the subconscious guilt and um, tremendous amount of betrayal that you felt because at some point you believe that to be true and most of your life was all around religion, like Islam specifically. I think when you're born you have this idea that you're a Muslim full stop and then everything else comes. Mm. Like you, have, you have to pray every day otherwise you're such a huge sinner and prayers always took precedence compared to like your uni work, your homework, everything, right? And that's like five times a day, waking up in the morning, evening, um, fasting had precedence over your physical health. Um, and, you know, reading the Quran as a form of therapy had more precedence over actually seeing a professional. So it's it's pretty much what it sounds like a cult where you're so, um, so like you're so um, engulfed in a lot of these ideas from what hand you eat with, with how you enter the bathroom or, you know, what hand you use to clean yourself. And um, it's, it's when you think about it now that I'm speaking out loud, it is definitely very 
control driven. Like it, it's not just, you know, hey, don't steal or believe in God. It's very much like this is what you're meant to do mm. or else you're accounting for sins. So I guess asking the question is really redundant to say uh, you were a Muslim. <laughs> so you were born into this. This was this was your life. And I guess uh, how many years would you say you were a Muslim? Um, I have mentioned this in previous podcasts that, you know, I realized I was an atheist later on in my life, but it was since I was 14. Like I stopped praying, I'd fast on and off. And the concept of God was never a God that was, um, that I was fearful of. Because I come from, I guess, an engineering mindset, believed in science, it was always about what I do and the outcomes of it, not praying right. and then hoping or wishful thinking. But it's always the opposite. Now, when I think about it, when I talk to my siblings and anything, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm waiting for this. And they'll always go like, if God wills. And I'm like, I was never like that. I would never go like, oh, if God wants, if God wills. I think I was an atheist long before I actually renounced my religion in public or even to myself. I think for the longest time, it was my identity that was so closely tied with a lot of what I do. I, you know, um, from how I dress to, I guess, um, what I do when I'm on my periods to walking home at night. Um, as a woman, there were so many stories from the Hadith or, you know, things that our parents would tell us about being possessed by um, an external entity, the jinn. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're on your periods, you have a higher chance of getting possessed. So like very, like the littlest of things were so controlled and you don't even realize it, how it just makes up your entire being. Now I'm aware some people have had it differently. Some people would say, oh, my family, they don't wear hijab. And I'm like, great, but, you know, it is an obligation for Muslims to wear hijab. It's in the Hadith. It's also in the Quran, but not specified how to wear it, just who do you need to wear it in front of. Um, but neither are prayers and how you, well, neither, neither is how you pray written in the Quran. It comes from the Hadith and you'll see different sects praying differently. So some of them will fold their arms, some of them will not, and some of them will have extra prayers. Some of them will have different timings of the prayers. Some of yeah. them will combine it. And it's always like, oh, we are the right ones. Um, but the mm -hmm. most convenient thing is that even Muslims among themselves would never really talk about it. I remember when I was young and I would watch TV and you'd always see the Shia. So I'm from a Shia um, denomination, which is a minority, not the smallest minority, but a good, crazy kind of minority. Um, and then there is a Sunni who are a bit more, in our opinion, like the Shia see the Sunnis as being more radical and vice versa. And I remember being young and I, and I used to tell my dad, and I'm like, you know what? The problem with Muslims is they have so much division that they can't even decide that we're all Muslims and this is how you literally break people apart. Mm. And, you know, for the longest time, I was like, I'm not a Shia, I'm a Muslim, and that's it. Like, you can't change my mind about it. And my parents slowly saw me, they're like, no, you're a Shia, you have to pray this way, or you have to get married this way, or you have to do this a certain way. And all of that was just like, how do they not see it that we're all Muslims? And I think slowly that kind of started breaking apart for me. Mm. You know, I did a live yesterday on, on this topic, like what is my goals and plans with Islam, right? Some people have already got really triggered because I did a video with me like holding my chin like this. And I said, a lot of Muslims are commenting on my, on my post that have nothing to do with Islam making truth claims. Islam's the truth and Muhammad is his prophet and things like that. And I said, maybe uh, Myth Vision family, maybe I should give them something to comment about, comment about. What do you think? You know, like triggering a few people, just being a little hype, you know, being a guy, you know, all right, I'll give them something to comment about. I'll do videos about Islam so that they understand I'm taking a critical scalpel 
to the Quran, to the Hadith, to the religion altogether. And um, I, I did the live and let Muslims come in. Wouldn't you know it, exactly what you said rang true. Two of these guys start debating. I'm talking now for like an hour over was, uh, does the Quran permit um, marrying uh, Aisha at nine years of age where uh, Muhammad's 53 has sex with a nine-year-old and this and that. And they're arguing over this Quran statement. And one of the guys goes, no, this is post um, you know, woman having period. And the other one's like, no, this is prepubescent. And like, they're arguing. And one of them calls the other one, a, um, Taffer. no worse. <laughs> What's going The Taliban. He literally said, you're a Taliban. You're this. And I'm like, hold on. Did you just call him like the hate among each other for like different stances on yeah. the Quran and interpretations. So anyway, I just thought I'd mention that to point out like the same problems happen in Christianity. It happens oh, in Judaism. It's the same thing. Absolutely. For the longest time, I felt like I'm not a Christian, so I will never know how to defend myself in Islam is definitely something I can talk about. And then I looked at the verses of Timothy and I was like, oh, okay, so you're no different. Like <laughs> women are still sex objects and women are still your property. And you know what I find really funny that the far right Christians and the Islamists who people don't see as far right because they're people of color have so much in common. Mm. Basically Islamists are the far right as well. They're just, not considered the Western far right, but they have so much in common. Talk about homosexuality, talk about um, racism, really. Like, you know, talk about different genders and gender ro gender defined roles. Like, it's, it's really surprising how they just hate each other, but they have so much in common. That's a fact, you're right. If you watch like uh, John MacArthur or any of these right wing Christian apologists, Women should be silent in the church. Women should this, this, that. Like, and in fact, even to this day, in the Christian and the Jewish idea, women are to blame for why sin entered the world. They ate the damn fruit and then gave it to the man. Zara, why did you guys do this? You see how ridiculous that is, though? Like, like can you imagine me blaming you for an apple or a fruit that you picked and God told you not to do it, but you did it and you screwed us all over Come on. Which is which is also so contradictory when they go like, oh no, but we must be protectors of women. Like they have no agency. Like we need to take care of them. You know, we need to provide for them. We need to put them on pedestals because they can't think on their own. Mm -hmm. And it or is actually one house. of exactly or like without my approval. Um, and while I personally never grew up like that. Um, not in that strict sense anyway. Um, there, there were bits and pieces of misogyny that were being thrown around without any further um, grounding to the, like, you know, sourcing Islam, Islamic um, scripture. Basically, until I was 16 and left Tanzania to go to Malaysia, I didn't know you couldn't wear a hijab. Like, I, it just never entered my head. Like, I would see um, a lot of the Pakistani or Bollywood actors with the last name being a Muslim name. And I'm like, probably they're not Muslim because I had never known of it. And then I go to Malaysia and, you know, I go to a prayer room in a shopping center and a woman enters wearing jeans and, you know, long hair, long black hair. And then there were obviously garments there and she puts it on, she puts it on, prays, takes it off, leaves. And I'm like, what? My world just changed. I was like, wait, you can do that. You can be a Muslim because that was my primary, right? If somebody is praying, they're a devout Muslim. Mm. Um, and, you know, there are very rare occasions that I would actually pray, but I would constantly, like if I was out with my friends who were also Muslim, they're like, oh, we're gonna go pray. And I'm like, cool, I'll go as well, cause I had to, but mm. I can't say I truly prayed um, unless I really needed something or really felt like it. And it would usually last two days, but not in a long period. Um, that, uh, that which, Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say that it brings me to the question. You said you weren't raised in like this strict uh, Muslim home. However, it, strict or not strict, various levels in which this might affect 
and impact the family. When you came out and said, look, I don't believe anymore. I guess it was gradual. I'm sure nothing was overnight. Probably it doesn't sound that way, the way you describe this, but when your family saw that you were outspoken, not just that you were like, okay, I'm just not practicing this anymore, but I am against this and I'm technically going to protest this, this whole thing. Um, how did they take that? And then how did your relationship with them get impacted? So I was one of the lucky ones before I was an activist. The first people I told about, I guess, except for my close friends, but the first people I told about not believing in Islam um, were my family in 2017. So not too long ago. And they were like, oh, you know, it's just a phase, you know, she'll grow out of it. I'm like, no, it's, uh, it's, I might not tell people I'm an ex-Muslim yet because I didn't know the title. Um, but I was slowly speaking out against the homophobia in Islam while being a Muslim. And I was just so against it. And my parents are like, my dad called me and he's like, you need to take down that post. And I'm like, no. He was like, so do you believe homosexuality is right? And I'm like, I'm not here to discuss that. I'm here to discuss how bullying and judging somebody is wrong. And he's like, okay, we're done with this conversation. And, you know, he hung up and I was like, cool. Like that, like with my dad, he's not a very chatty person. So disagreements is pretty much like, okay, I'll step away which is fine, um, you know, but when I was going to do my first podcast, um, I had already separated from my family because I knew they didn't want me to do it. And I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, that can risk your life, so I'm going to go the other way. And they weren't happy about it. I just ended up blocking them, mm. said my piece, blocked them. And then when I did my first podcast, my brother messages me and he's like, I heard your podcast, I see where you're coming from can you please unblock me? And I was like, I'm not ready. And then I do it a few weeks later. And then we have a chat and he's like, look, I get where you're coming from, but you don't have to let go of family. Like we're trying, like we're trying to understand and nobody's asking you to pray or anything, but you know, we don't want you to be an activist. It can't be safe for you because he saw, you know, the live comments and the threats I was getting. And he was so surprised. He's like, what? And then also seeing it from familiar names, like people from my community threatening me. It was Can just- you tell me about these threats a little bit? I'd be interested to hear like what kind of a, this is the most important part I think that we need to address because I can crit critique the Bible and Christians do not like it. They might even hate me. They don't death threat me. I've had one guy who ever threatened me. He was going to beat my ass. We had an argument. Then he was talking about, I'll send you to God. You know, like, but that's not like a direct no, threat. Like, tell I, me. Yeah. I have had in person, I have had online threats, like proper threats. If it's not, I will rape you and your family. Or I think the first time I did my podcast, I actually mentioned that I'm not in touch with my family because I need to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I was still getting rape threats. They're like, oh, you just wanted to be a whore. You wanted to be a slut. And, you know, and the threats gradually increased. Like after the live event was over, people are like, change your name. You don't deserve to keep a Muslim name. And I'm like, my name's not going anywhere. So um, when I finally finished the podcast, people are like, oh, you know, repent and come back to Islam. Otherwise you're gonna burn in hell. Or, you know, how could you reject the religion of Islam? Like, how could you talk about Muhammad that way? Like, you know, I will kill you. I'll find you. I've literally posted so many of them to a point that Facebook blocked me because I posted a screenshot of, of the somebody threatening, threatening threatening me. Like, wow. rape and death. I was in Facebook jail for 30 days and it happened three times. And I'm like... I don't know what to do at this point. Like, I just, you guys just have to take my word for it. But, you know, they gradually got, you know, they, they increased. And I was never planning to be an activist at all. I just did a podcast, Deconversion Story. That's it. That's where it was meant to end. And I just see that people are threatening me. And then I went to a debate mm -hmm. where a friend of mine in Australia was debating one of the Hizbut Tahir um, guys in a university. And my friend's like, what is the punishment of apostates in 
Islam according to Sharia law. And he's like, oh, there are many, you know, there are many punishments and whatnot. And then, you know, a minute later, it's like, yeah, death being one of them. And I'm like, so why can't you just say that? And then, and then my friend's like, and you want Sharia law in Australia? And little did I know that, you know, in a safe country like Australia, like I'd never sensed that fear or that people like him actually exist. I thought it was just an online thing. And he was like, no, um, I want Sharia law in Australia. And yes, one of the punishments of apostates is killing. And that would not be considered as hate speech because he's not trying to kill anyone. He's not threatened to kill anyone. And I'm like, hang on. Um, if you said the same thing just about somebody, you know, being a Muslim, you would be like in jail for that. Mm-hmm. That's exactly like kind of what happened with me in Hyde Park in London, where I actually had somebody threatening me on video. Right, I have this video. In and then person. He, in person. In person. Basically, me and my friend were just walking, and this woman was this Christian woman, not the one who was slashed, another one. She was criticizing, and she wasn't, yeah, she was criticizing. She's like, you're a prophet, married a nine-year-old, or married a six-year-old and a child. I went up to her, and I'm like, look, they're all ganging up on you, and you're alone. It's not worth it. And then I left, and they saw me talking to her, and the person comes to me, and he's like, you're from Pakistan. How could you not be a Muslim? And I'm like, why the fuck do you care where I'm from? Like, even if I told you, you wouldn't know it. But at the same time, I was just, like, looking at him starts slut shaming me and whatnot takes his phone and then starts recording saying you know this woman and me and my friend and this man called all muslim terrorists and if you find her come speak to her and i'm like i'm sorry that is a malicious video that was recorded for the intention of hurting me not that i'd actually said any of that but he had an intention Mm. And um, the police were like, oh, just don't go to Hyde Park because he doesn't have your address. He can't harm you. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but he literally on the video said that if he finds me outside Hyde Park, he would hurt me. Like he actually said, I'd bash you. And I'm like, "Okay." (laughs) And the police are not going to do anything about it. And they're like, just don't go to that area. And I'm like, hang on. You see so many cases of hijabis being... um, you know, dehumanized, and I don't support that at all, but where are my rights? Why are you silenced against another minority when I'm the one who's actually being attacked here? Mm. And I just found that suddenly, like, you know, the police was really curious, that individual police, and, you know, she was like, what did your, you know, the always, uh, the, the question is, you know, how did your parents take it? And I'm like, I am one of the mi- minorities that actually have a good relationship with my family. For the most part, I acknowledge that the other people don't. And it was a battle for me to get to where I am. But right now, in this day and age, my parents are not worried about me going to hell. They're worried about other Muslims hurting me. Wow. That says yeah. a lot. Because they believe in hell still. Yeah, they do. But like, they don't, they've never. They've never actually, I, I, I can't remember, maybe it's been such a long time, but I've never actually been threatened with like, oh, you're going to go to hell by right. my family. Like it's never, and I was like, okay, cool. But, you know, I've seen my family progress because of me from more like these practicing, you have to pray kind of Muslims to like, you know right. what, this is your journey. And like, you know, you Respect. do you. And, yeah, and like, not, not just for me, this is for my siblings as well. Like, you know, I took off the hijab, but like in some occasions when my sisters don't wear it at the beach, like, you know, there'll still be long sleeves. But, you know, if we're going for a walk and it was like a private kind of area or something, you know, and they won't wear it. Um, my, my parents really were never, I guess there were times when I went swimming and I wouldn't wear it and it was fine. Um, mm. But they're not as harsh as, I guess, a lot of people who I get coming to Faithless Hijabi, like the, the women that I support. Um, if I can ask, uh, so you're now outspoken. You get all these threats. 
one of the biggest things actually that caught my attention and I found out about you and was interested in knowing more. And we talked months ago and I said, Hey, I'd be interested in getting like your story on what happened, but it was too early. It was like, it had just happened too much was going on. Um, can you lead us up to what happened? Like, but build up the narrative a little bit on, on what ended up happening to your arrest. Yeah, so um, as any sane person would do this, they would take the threats seriously in a country where, you know, um, there isn't the best justice system. But I was like, it's Tanzania. I'm not breaking the law. It's not a Muslim country. And, you know, I, I told my parents, I'm like, are you sure I'll be fine? My parents are like, yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. You know, mm. we'll cater to whatever, like, needs you have like you never have to come visit you never have to go see your cousins if you feel uncomfortable and we had a good deal and my brother was going through a divorce and like when he got served the court notice and like two days i booked my flight but within those two days me booking my flight i was like these are my conditions you can't force me to do this i can't do this i can't do this. and i'm allowed to go out with my friends even if it's drinking and we both agreed we had a mutual ground and i went there and what was meant to be a three week trip extended to being six months. But initially I was meant to leave after the end of month four. And literally right before I was going to leave on the weekend because the flights, you didn't need a PCR test with COVID or anything. You just needed a flight back from Tanzania. And it was like 300 pounds. And I was like, okay, I'll just book it last minute because I don't need to prep anything. So whenever I'm ready to go and the weekend that I was meant to fly, my brother gets a call from the police and he's like, oh, you need to come in. And at that point we were like, it makes no sense, but it, it startled my brother a little. And I'm like, but you haven't done anything. Ask them what it's for. And they're like, oh, we can't tell you over the phone. You need to come in. And I was like, oh, well, you know, it's probably nothing. It's probably, you know, you talking about, because there was a church next to where we lived and the church was really loud and we were talking about it on a public group. So I'm like, it's probably about the church, but you have no grounds to not talk about it. You know, people can say they're unhappy with it, but then they can't really arrest you over expressing your views that you don't like the loud noise. There's a right. law. And he's called in and he's like, can you come in with me? And I'm like, sure, I'll stay in the car, but you're going up with a lawyer. And, you know, we just called a random lawyer, random business lawyer that we knew, but we're like, we know somebody, we need somebody who knows law just in case. And he calls me and he's like, five minutes in. And he's like, Zara. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, this is about you. You need to come in. And I'm like, what? He's like, it's about your Facebook post. And I'm like, why did they call you in? And he's like, I can't talk anymore. And he was a loudspeaker and he was like, just come in. And he was pretty shaken up because, you know, obviously I'm an activist, but at the same time, there were no Tanzanian laws that I've broken. And I go in, so, you know, before I go in and I'm like, I need to tell somebody about this. So I text three people, like my two of my friends and then, yeah, three of my friends, I text, three random people in three different time zones, one in Tanzania. And I'm like, if you don't hear from me in three hours, you make some noise because why didn't they call me? And like, why weren't they like, hey, this is about Zara, she needs to come in. Um, and I was like, well, if I'm going to the police, they're likely going to take away all my devices. So before I go in, I send a tweet. Now I was called in like literally four or five days after I posted a photo of two men kissing in front of the Kaaba. And that led to a lot of threats coming in, even from my community, my former community. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, but you can't do anything about it. Like there are no blasphemy laws in Tanzania. But what happened was basically when I went in, they didn't know my legal name. They didn't know where I was from. They thought I was Tanzanian because my family is Tanzanian. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm Australian. Like, what grounds are you arresting me on? And they got a bit shaken up and they were like, oh, you posted this to post about the president. And I look at the post and they were like, and it was basically me calling the president dumb because he arrested somebody who laughed at him. Well, not him, but because, you know, I guess he was a very sensitive president where he couldn't talk about anything. I was, I was just like, this is so dumb. Why do you need to arrest people over it? 
but that was posted eight months before I'd actually visited Tanzania. So I was in the UK when I wrote it. And I was like, this makes no sense. And then I whispered to my brother and I'm like, this is a setup. And before my phone was taken, like literally before I get in the room, I had pressed tweet and I was like, going into the police station, someone may have reported my blasphemy post. Now, unofficial, I had no charges. Even the police didn't know what to arrest me on because they didn't realize it would ever get to the media. Their plan was to get me arrested for a few days, teach me a lesson, and then let me go. But what happened to be was um, I made too much of a noise. Like I was just like, I was like, well, you can't arrest me on no grounds. And then they start building up charges. They're like, so where are you from? And I'm like, Australia. And they're like, when did you get your Australian citizenship? And I'm like, four years ago or, you know, three years ago or something. And they were like, um, where's your Tanzanian passport? And I'm like, I don't have it. I've never used it. Like, I got my Australian citizenship. I moved to the UK and never really used my passport. And they're like, oh, so you're holding two passports. And I'm like, not really, because I lost one. And they're like, you know, they start building up these charges. And I'm like, these are unprofounded charges. It makes no sense. You don't arrest somebody because they have two passports. You arrest them if they can't pay the fine for it, if another passport is found on them, mm -hmm. or if they've used a passport. And I was like, you think I can't pay a $200 fine? Like, I, I was just like, that makes no sense. So they start building up more charges. And they're like, whose SIM card are you using? And I'm like, borrowed my sister's phone. Um, or like, you know, somebody from the family gave me um, a SIM card. So pretty much, you know, I had a work phone and a personal phone and they took my personal phone in. And, um, you know, they're like, oh, you know, whose SIM card is this on? And they found out it was my sister. They're like, oh, you weren't using your own SIM card. And I'm like, can you show me that law, please? And There's they didn't no show me the law. And so, <laughs> so the law says, so the law says that you are not allowed to show identification of somebody else when you're registering the SIM card. It's like ID fraud. So I can't mm. go in and say I am Derek, and this is my, and I need to register a SIM card under Derek. Right. But if I go and get a SIM card, you need to give a reason to why you're getting another SIM, which my sister did. She's like, my sister is traveling, so I'm going to get her another SIM card. And then I'm, and it was all fine. Like, you know, the company is like, oh, okay, cool. If you have a legit reason, that's fine. And, you know, that's how she gave me the SIM card. And I'm like, can you show me the law? And they didn't have any. And they didn't know what to say. Oh, and my gosh. I, so they kept doing and this was, and finding ways oh, to like. Oh, yeah. And they basically um, lied about, they, they lied in my statement saying that, um, I intentionally knew it. I intentionally knew this laws and I didn't comply by them. And, um, and because like it was the morning when I went and I got out at like five or 6 PM is when they finished the interrogation. So I didn't actually get out and I'm like, I haven't eaten or drank. Like I had water, but I haven't eaten or like had my medicine. So I'm anxious. I want to go home and get my meds. And you know, they had to stop the interview and then like the interrogation. And then I waited for another hour. And the next thing I know, they're shoving me in a car and I'm like, where are we going? And they're like, oh, we're going home. You live in this area. Tell us where exactly. And I take them home and now I haven't been given a warrant. I don't have my keys. And I'm like, you've just put me in a car. I don't even know where I'm going. And um, they basically do an unwarranted house search and I had to wait for my sister to get the keys. And I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. But it gave me the opportunity to change into something comfortable because I was like, I can't, it's too hot to wear jeans. But at the same time, I had no idea why there were like three people in my house. Um, Are they planting stuff? We don't even know. Exactly. Yeah. Because they have done it before. They have right. planted drugs in people's houses. Now we had cameras outside the house. So we knew that they didn't come in with a lot. So that was a good sign. But then at the same time. Could have had something in his pocket. Yeah, he could. Yeah, he absolutely could. It's, it's, it's not like he, they didn't try. They literally would not process my bail. They 
my lawyer was like my lawyer was um, had conflicting loyalties. That's what I'm going to say. My yeah. lawyer had conflicting loyalties because when he started off the case, he told my brother, this is how much it was going to cost. And then when the news got wide and he's like, oh, well, you know, why don't you open a fundraiser and get people to support you and then charges me 20 times what he had said. And my brother's like, we need to get you out of here because there is no justice system. So if this lawyer can do it, he can do it. But, you know, after the first week, he just did not give a shit. He took all the money, did not do the work. My brother was like the one chasing up the police. And weeks later, like not even weeks later, three days later, we find out that my passport has been stolen. Um, they coerced my sister to bring my passport to, like my Australian passport to the police station and my passport has been stolen. And during all of this, I've been calling the Australian consulate and I'm like, I emailed you in October. So this happened in December. And I'm like, I emailed you in October that I was getting threats from Islamists and you told me to report it to the police. But the police are the abusers. Like they have been bought off and I'm, like, you know, these threats have come before where people are like, oh, we're going to frame her. And I was like, surely they can't do that. And oh, they well, did. They because, yeah. And they did. And um, what was disappointing is that the Australian consulate didn't want to make that one phone call because they didn't want to break diplomatic ties. They're like, if we make the phone call, then your case is going to be extended out even longer because then they would have to find a charge. Like, they're going to have to find what something concrete to put you there. Anyway, my passport was stolen. And then what was, because the news went um, viral and I actually went to the media saying, they're not dropping my charges and the Australian government isn't doing anything. Um, when my charges were finally dropped and I got a police report for my passport being lost, um, the Australian government was like, oh, how do we know my charges were dropped? And I'm like, did they call you and tell you my charges were filed in the first place? Do you know what charges I have? Because I don't. They never told me my charges. I never had a charge. And they lied to the media. They said it was over having two passports, but I, had, I didn't have two passports. And then when I, when I actually had other lawyers, because my lawyer wasn't doing anything, so I had other lawyers in Australia who went to um, uh, the Ministry of uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and they had a meeting and in two hours my passport was printed. Um, and when I got my passport and I flew back, well, the first time I was detained again, but the second time when I actually got to fly back, um, I gave in my first, in, like when I was in the flight, I wrote my first interview to the local newspaper and I'm like, this is up to you if you want to publish it. And then the journalist was actually so surprised because he never understood it. He's like, if it's a passport issue, why are you reporting to the police? You should be reporting to the immigration. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? You tell me because I told you already they didn't know my legal name. So how is it a passport issue when they've given me a visa four times on my Australian passport? My fingerprints haven't changed. I came into the country. They never asked me because I wasn't carrying two passports. So what so happened? There's no other. There is no other explanation that fits the criteria other than you caused a lot of ruckus in the Islamist world. And they weren't basically, having it. No. So basically, when they found out that the media had gone quite high up and sorry, and that the file had gone quite high up because of the media and because they didn't have any evidence, they were they knew their jobs were under threat because the investigating officer and the person who had initially called my brother were both suspended for a week and one of them was i think both of them might have been, spent a few nights in jail because every time i went to report initially it was every day so every time i went to report you'd see them with the same clothes and no and slippers but the times previously or the times after he would wear a proper suit and I was like, this is weird. And then my lawyer actually told me that, well, yeah, he had to spend four nights or three nights in jail because they don't know where your passport is. 
And I'm like, they lost my passport. <laughs> and my lawyer didn't bother to notify um, the embassy because the way things work in Tanzania is if you're a lawyer, you want to have good contacts with the police for your future cases. It doesn't matter about your case right now because you'll be fine. You're a Western woman anyway and you have money. Um, so if you're light colored, that equates to you having money. But that was literally wow. like one of the issues where they're like, oh, you know, you can you can pay for her bail, but you're not a, you're not meant to pay for a bail. Um, and, you know, for, for me to get food or for me to get anything, they had to pay the officer. I'm like, oh, can you give her her meds, please? Um, and basically when my passport was stolen, we actually had one of the police officers who talked to a family friend saying, look, I'm in dipshit because we took a bribe from one of your community members and I don't know how to get out of it. So if she goes to the media even more, I'll lose my job. And I'm like, I don't care. Right. <laughs> I am not going to care. So we had a police officer who did confess to it, but he wouldn't do it. Like he wouldn't actually go to his superiors with that because he'd get in trouble. But as soon as I came back, because my friends had networks around Kenya as well, and Kenya and Tanzania are quite close, so the Kenyan army can, the Kenyan army basically knew somebody at the police station. And um, it was kind of, and this was when I was arrested. This wasn't even like a few days after I was bail. This was like during my arrest, my friends already knew who it was because they found out from one of the people who that person was. And now obviously I know the name and I also know that he's from the community leadership board. I can't name them for That's fine. any other reasons. But it was it was no surprise. It was because I've had threats from them and I've had like literally that screenshot, which is also in my YouTube channel, that screenshot where they're like Oh, um, why is she talking about it? why is she talking about people's religion? She has no right to. And somebody comments, "Oh, maybe we should frame her for being against the government as well." And then you see all the comments preceding. And when I had initially talked about my community doing it, nobody believed me mm. until I left, and there were no charges. And they're like, "Wait, so a case like this that goes to international media comes out with no charges." It was so obvious that somebody had paid them. And because I didn't keep my mouth shut, you know, it also kind of backfired on whoever was paid. I, I have to say this, though. I mean, like, this is the most horrific thing that you can do, right? In a country where you're supposed to be allowed to speak about this stuff, it's just not against the law. Um, you're lucky you didn't end up in, like, Saudi Arabia or something, right? Like, and get exactly. caught. Exactly. Because you'd exactly. be dead. You'd probably be dead or you would convert so you didn't die. You see what I'm saying? I have actually had a lot of cases where I've, actually, where I've had to ask them, you're going to have to lie. We need you alive. We're going to have to lie. We've had people in hiding in some parts of India and Sri Lanka who cannot escape, who can't leave their houses because of this. So, well, I got really, really lucky, but this was like a secular country with corruption. Imagine what happens to people who are basically in those countries that have those laws. And who we don't have in their right mind would want that other than someone who is like completely absorbed into the into this whole religion to a point where they actually take the ideology sincere. Like if someone spoke against Muhammad, if someone said, I don't like him. Sorry, from what I've read about him, I don't like him. I think he's a bad person, right? From what I understand about him. Well, what are you, what? My prophet? And you want to actually kill someone about a man you read in a book or exactly. in books that you don't even know. Like it makes, it makes no sense. I've tried finding a Jewish or a Christian equivalent and I'm like, I can't, I can't think of anything that people hold so dear over no rationality at all. You can have people criticize Gandhi or you can have people criticize Deepak Chopra Jesus. and a lot of different people and Jesus. And I was like, I've never seen anybody try beheading somebody because of a cartoon. Now, don't get me wrong. In speech. history... Christianity has done this. Oh, right? absolutely. But, what, but that's why I'm glad we live in a world 
I do, and you probably do, uh, in a separation of church and state, you know, thanks for the separation. I hope it stays that way. I don't think they ever belong together. I really don't. Yeah. No, no, they absolutely do not. Like thinking about the current situation in Afghanistan and then the new laws about banning music and I'm, and people are like, oh, the Taliban will give women rights. But according to Sharia law and according to Sharia law, so long as men exist within that realm or around your surroundings, you're, you won't be allowed to work. You won't be allowed to wear what you want to wear. Hmm. So you're pretty much like you're always going to be not even covered, you're always going to be under the shadows of men. Um, And like, I can understand why there are feminists who have left Christianity and have gone third wave to being more misandrists. But what I don't understand is that there is not enough rage when it comes to Muslim men who's done the same. Somehow they're like, oh, but it's it's their culture. We can't talk about it. And I'm like, hang on, do women from Muslim backgrounds not re- not deserve the same rights? Now, in no way am I advocating for unequal rights, be it the other way. But I'm finding this cognitive dissonance when it comes to feminists and Western liberals that I think they've just left out women from my background. Mm. And I understand that there are different, um, like intersectionality can be perceived differently. And, you know, there are different layers to the misogyny that we've faced. You'll hear a lot of people say, oh, but honor killings are not part of Islam. So I'm like, hang on, let's look at stats and facts. Where do they exist? Why do they exist? And what leads to it? And it's really deeply rooted misogyny where, you know, the punishment for somebody having sex outside of marriage for a woman is stoning them. Um, and the woman gets a larger, like a bigger punishment than a man for a rapist to marry a rapist because, you know, it's called, it's, it's called adultery, not rape. That's um, interesting. Yeah. In the Bible, there's clear. Yeah. It's like that in the Bible, Hebrew Bible as well. You, if you rape a woman, she usually is sold or, or at least meaning the father, they have the legal right, the dad, right? Cause the daughter's his property. Exactly. Um, they have the legal right to like say to the man who raped, Hey, you owe me 30 shekels, which in those days was a lot, unless you were rich, you know, you had a lot of money, but Hey, you owe me 30 shekels. Take my daughter. It's like, Whoa. Can you imagine like today, the rapist who raped your child, you're like, yeah, well, look, man, you already took the most valuable thing f- from her, which is her virginity. She's useless now. I mean, if that is how your worldview kind of looks at women to a point where, well, her virginity has gone, the most valuable thing about her, get rid of her. Uh, we, I, I don't want this burden the rest of my life because no man will marry her now. I, I'm glad we live in the 21st century, you know, where we're oh absolutely i think i think it's crazy like i was reading up on a lot of honor so we've actually started a chapter at faithless hijabi where we look at honor crimes and the reasons for it and it always comes down to women being commodities where they're like oh well you know she caused a stain to the family kill her like it's so easy for them to turn that switch and you're dead and they live fine with it. And governments are supported by saying, well, if you kill her because she's caused dishonor to your family, you're not going to get a larger sentence. You'll get five years at most. What do you think that says? Um, I, I feel like, you know, when people talk about honor killings and when you bring it to light to other Muslims, they're like, oh, this is culture, this isn't Islam. Mm. And I'm like, but culture and religion are so intertwined that they follow one another. When religion came into light, it was based on the culture that was present there and to establish some order and control mostly. And then they were spread around where, you know, where it started from Arabia and going to East Asia mm-hmm. and, you know, be it through war or conquest or, you know, um, convenience because you know people didn't know any better why would I pay taxes when I can just be a Muslim and I yeah. have to do the bare minimum and convert and because we already lived in a society that was already quite sexist adding more to it didn't seem like a pain until centuries later 
unquote, it's been like 14 centuries or something later, we have, you know, these things that have followed us where in 2021, we have women that are being raped because they didn't wear the right clothes and by right clothes, it'd be they wouldn't cover their hair where you've taught a man to only respect women who cover up. But the majority of the women in the world do not cover up. And then we have this issue that also creates a rise of the far right where they don't, they categorize all Muslim men or all Muslims to be one group versus yeah. a nuanced gray shade. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's a hate being projected. One one hate's causing another hate. So, I like, mean, you've got one, far left that's saying, yeah, we'll look past Muslims it. altogether. Like, uh, there's no problem here. I mean, man, they're not that big of a deal. And then we're watching Afghanistan actually be taken over by Taliban. Look, leave them alone. They don't mean harm. It's like, are you blind? And then you have the other side that's so extreme saying, all Muslims, all Islam is evil and like the people and the, they go so far that they don't find that it's a gray issue. It's like saying all Christians are evil because Ku Klux Klan members are Christians. And it's like, no, like there's if you've ever been to Europe, there are like Christians who are super liberal in their approach. They're not literalist. They say, well, there's contradictions in the Bible and I'm just a cultural Christian. I like to go to church every once in a while, but. And then you go, do you believe the resurrection of Jesus happened? Well, it might have, uh, but I just believe it. And you're like, you're cool. Whatever, man. Like, I think there's some cognitive dissonance maybe on why you practice it or there's a cultural reason. But like, you're not out here trying to convert people. You don't care if people think like you or not. And yet, you know, I wish that because I don't see Islam going anywhere. I think it's like such a massive religion that the only thing we could try to do is like change it and try to reform it and maybe keep educating people about the cognitive dissonance and show problems with its religion and its its origins and why it's just as bad off in terms of its complications textually as the bible like that's what i'm i'm going to be trying to do on my show if that makes sense yeah no i get it i used to be for islamic reform but i find that's also a difficult task to do that everybody who i looked up to for reform had suddenly given up on it with the rise of extremism where even muslims who would listen to these other muslims talking about reform would not agree to them and they would send them death threats thinking about hijabi models like halima aden or arden uh, Halima Aden, yeah, Halima Aden. It's a she's a Somali hijabi model. She'll probably get the same death threats as I do, because she's still covering up and she's still praying and she's still a devout-ish Muslim. At the same time, for you see both of us on the streets alone, somebody would probably try to kill us with the threats that we've gotten. So it's not even a safe world for other Muslims, which is exactly what I was saying. Like my parents fear more about other Muslims hurting me. Then they don't have time to, to worry about hell. Yeah, they don't have time to worry about it. They're so concerned about their own supposed family of religion. Like, ah, that's so crazy. Like, I could imagine, you know, someone saying, be careful of another religion, you know, be careful. But when your own religion, it's like in the ancient world, you had tribalism, right? Like my tribe versus your tribe. Okay, got it. Watch out for the Amalekites or the Ishmael, whatever, you know, I'm giving an example from the Bible, but like, watch out for those other tribes. You haven't said, listen, in our own community, watch out for our own friends that we supposedly worship the same God and follow the same prophet. Watch out, you know, because you don't think like us. So make sure you watch out because you might get raped and killed and murdered and whatever. My parents were just so shocked after what happened. Like my dad was just like, I cannot trust the community leaders. Like my dad used to be so devout to the community, let alone the religion, like like, like serving the people, that he gave more attention towards the mosque versus his own business. And, you know, my fees wasn't paid on time and we weren't financially capable to afford like, you know, four kids going to school. So it was always like late, paid late or, um, you know, I had to sit outside classes and I'm like, this is the man whose daughter got arrested when he gave all of his life to the mosque. And then he was like, I, at the very least, I didn't deserve to go through what they put me through because the biggest thing that really hurt the community 
was why is my family sticking by me? It's like, you know, they, they were they were to be against you. Exactly. They wanted them to abandon me. They wanted them to go like, oh, you've brought disdain on the family. And my parents are like, no, you know, like for the longest time, like I was like, oh, you don't deserve to like pay for my legal fees, you know, and they're like, no, no, this is a family issue. And it was really interesting that a lot of people had never thought about what impact it would have on my family, like other Muslims that they're trying to hurt because I'm a non-Muslim. Like they never thought about it until I came out and spoke about it. And I'm like, you know, I did not care because I thought I was from a liberal community, mm -hmm. but it was my family that was more liberal or relatively liberal where, you know, they've gone on this journey with me and they haven't tried killing me, but it was never a question. We were never raised like that. Good for your parents. Um, it was it was interesting, but then I see this other side where I'm constantly working with girls and men as well, boys and girls and men and women, and it's always about like keeping them safe, having them to you know getting them to lie for a bit until they're financially independent, and the constraints that has not only on their physical health but their mental health as well, and you know that restrictive freedom, and then what happens when you're public or show your face is you get death threats. And for the longest time, I feel like, you know, there we've, we've kind of been left alone in this. Like, you know, ex-Muslims get attacked by moderate Muslims. You get attacked by other kind of Muslims, like the extremists and moderate Muslims who are like, oh, that's not the real Islam that you're talking about. Like, you know, if you go like, well, Taliban is practicing Sharia law and they're like, oh, well, that's not the real Islam. Like, you know, that's of what course. moderate Muslims will say. And then you'll have the regressive left that will say the same thing. And then you have the far right where they're like, yeah, all of you guys should never come to the West. And, you know, you should never, you know, we don't want anything to do with you. And then it's, it's just like you're in the middle of so much. No um, one knows what's the right, just, what's the wrong. Yeah. You're just an island. You're just an island where I feel like a lot of the white atheists, which I mean Christian atheists, have, you know, have like, they call ex-Muslim activists so brave. And I'm like, honestly, I don't think I'm that brave as compared to people who are actually living it in that middle, in, in the Middle East and to families in the West. But then at the same time, you think about how many battles you're fighting. It's like you're an island of your own. And that now, not only do we have other regressive people, like, you know, when you see people fighting for Afghanistan and I see some videos and they're like, oh, that's not Islam. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Or the most ironic thing I saw this morning was a woman with a free Palestine flag you know, talking about the Taliban banning music, uh, music as it's their country, their laws. And I'm like, the irony is so real when you talk about free Palestine, but you can't imply it, like you can't, you can't, you, you refuse to leave it. It's like, it's so convenient for you to impose such extremist ideas on other people as long as you're not affected. And somehow your empathy is enlightened when you're talking about Palestine or you're talking about the Uyghur Muslims in China, then it's not their country, their laws. So why is there this hypocrisy? Like, and they also come from a place of privilege where, you know, they live in the West. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be subjugated. These are women who don't wear hijab. And I'm like, I'm sorry. But in Iran, I have some of the girls that I knew in their 20s in jail for another 20 years. And you're here telling me hijab is not, is a choice. And I'm like, please. Yeah. You're you're lying to me, you're lying to yourself. And so many times I've had this surge of like young Muslims between the age of like 14 to like 22, 23 women, like, you know, girls and boys and yeah, anyway. Um, but I've had them come up with so much hate and they were born and brought up in the West. And I'm like, why? Why do you have so much hate? Mm. Like you're 14 years old. When I was 14, I couldn't give a shit about who said what about my religion. I was just happy being a child. Yeah. And then I realized I saw this TV show in on Netflix. It was based in Sweden and it was um, called The Caliphate. And you see how from that young age that, you know, when they were immigrants, were Muslims have always like, kept themselves segregated 
from the outside community and you know their kids end up feeling like they're always attacked but they're not it's only because their parents parents have chosen that yeah exactly their parents have taught them to like be segregated in that like you're well one in any country you go to if i went to saudi not that i would go but if i went to saudi arabia Don't i'm go. not going to i'm not going to but like <laughs> if i went if i okay so if i went so okay well example you know if i came to sweden it's a very different culture than australia right people are friendlier they're speaking a different language but um there are different cultural norms and very different minute things right like you just don't do this or you just do that and this is like another western country right so it's not very conflicting but like i cannot expect that a country would change because i eat like you know for instance i eat halal meat like everybody else has to eat halal meat and somehow then the parents have taught their children that hey you see they don't want to do this so they're obviously against us they obviously have something against us you're already building up walls yes exactly and you're already segregating yourself and it goes on for a generation i remember growing up and you know when the afghanistan um the iraq war is happening yes this was in 20 2007 2011 around around that time period there was iraq syria um and afghanistan all at the same time and it was all invaded by western armies and for the longest time and even like very recently you know my dad asked me why does the us have to intervene in the middle east and i'm like oh i don't know dad it's part of the us united nations where they're put there like do you think people want to go outside their comfort zone and fight for another country like there is a lot of history with afghanistan but like in general there is a united nations um you know that they have there's a united nations constitution that com- that go- governments need to comply by to keep the citizens safe like they do in congo it's not just the middle east they do it in other parts of africa you know it exists but you never hear about it because you know the focus is solely like you know america trying to inv- you know invade the middle east and i'm like and see what happens when they leave mm. i mean they, they were already I, more in i guess most were already on the side of what taliban believe than america's western uh ideas so like i guess uh there's some obviously i suspect that wish they could get out of there but the majority it's like a step in a more stricter direction of course but it's like you know this is what we already kind of believe so really they're closer to our side than the westerners who came and invaded in our land i don't know what do you think i i kind of disagree because i feel like for the longest time like the generations have been born in the past 20 years you know who are adults now and having kids they've grown up in the war zone so they're likely to believe that america's bad right, right. any That's invasion I mean. is bad right so Not when they left that they though. agree yeah so when they left though some people were happy until right. now slowly well obviously there's a small minority that we obviously hear about but as things go on and things are getting more restricted slowly a lot of people are going to come to realize that this is not what we signed up for Mm-hmm. but it is like it is exactly the same thing that hate that has been created and that separation that has been created where people do see Afghanistan being now led by freedom fighters because America has left they're not our people right. right and sure like you know America came in to you know initially with the wrong intentions and you know maybe leaving was safer for american troops but at the same time their transition was completely unnatural right it was unwarranted i remember a month and a half ago i was having calls with the home affairs in australia and they're like oh yeah afghanistan like our troops are leaving we have some visas open but clearly not enough for those who did help afghani um sorry who did help the army in us in afghanistan like local afghans who did help mm-hmm. and I think it was exactly the same thing that wall that has been kept without any rationality like I'm sure like you know thinking about you know my family going to the west versus my family going to like Afghanistan and I'm like 
you were, you know, you talk about the West not being there, but you would never live in a country like that. Neither yeah. would I. Neither would my sisters who are Muslims as well. Like, none of them would you. ever live in that. I see and, this on YouTube about, like, Muslims who talk about Sharia law, this, this, that, how good it is. And uh, I don't, you're probably aware of, like, apostate prophet and other guys on YouTube that do this stuff. He's like, well, why don't you just move on over to Afghanistan, buddy? It sounds like that's what you want. And of course, I very much doubt that that's what they will do. That They, they would even I don't, want that. Yeah. To be fair, Sharia law as a concept was taught to us as the justice, right? Mm -hmm. But nobody really can agree on what Sharia law even means. Like if you look at it in the most fundamentalist sense is what the Taliban is doing. But would I want to live in a country that has no music, even though until I was 14, I heard no music. Now I can listen to whatever I want to. Like, would I move there? No. Like, even when I was a Muslim, we were like, oh, yeah, Sharia law. And then would I actually live in that? Do I know what it means? Like, from the, <laughs> it's like it's like you asking every Muslim, like, do you like do you think that the right way for anybody to live their life is to believe in God? Yes. Right. But then not what comes after it, which is, you know, the belief in God comes with this, 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 this conditions right. that they haven't really talked about. I guess most Muslims are better than what Islam preaches because you'll have that tick with them like, oh, yeah, Sharia law, oh, yeah, perfect. OK, but do you know what that means? Do you know that means that you can't apply any makeup or that you will have your face covered? amongst other things like having, you know, thieves' arms chopped off or people stoned to death for adult, like adultery and like fornication. Um, like, do you know what would happen to or people? Or like halal centers. I've heard about those supposedly where they go and they have this law where if a husband divorces the wife three times, they cannot get back with the husband unless they have sex and marry another man till that man is sexually satisfied. And this is not in the Hadith. This It is in the Hadith, but this is in the Quran. In the Quran. Yeah. And so they have these loophole religious centers. I call them loopholes because it's like finding the like it's like finding ways in the law to kind of like slide secret ways of making things work. And so they call the, the local imam or whatever and say, hey, check it out. Um, how much for three weeks to marry my wife, you know, oh, yeah. do, do what you want with her. Uh, but I'm tired of her. She pissed me off, whatever. And so they go and they pay the man for a couple days, a couple hours, a couple weeks, whatever. Take my wife, marry her until you're sexually satisfied. And then I'll marry her again. Cause they believe the, the whole Quran so much that they create these systems. So that's actually kind of. I was just going to say, so that's actually part of Shia Islam, like temporary marriage. It's called muta, which is a time-based marriage. And similar conditions apply, but you're constrained by time, which is, I will marry you for an hour. Great. Okay, cool. Here's a marriage certificate. So if you're ever caught with the police, with, the, with a man who is not your husband, you can show them that, hey, you are married for an hour or obviously longer. Um, but then you're right, you know, how when you were talking about your live stream where how young does the age have to be? Is it prepubescent or is it, you know, when a girl bleeds? And basically you can't consume sex until a girl bleeds. And that's what they consider a woman, but you can marry her before that. She is meant to cover up when she is about nine-ish in the prepubescent phase. She is meant to cover up starting then. Um, and what is interesting is that once you divorce, um, the people like, you know, she, she can technically marry your father as well after you divorce. She can, um, you said? she can. Yeah. So like you marry your dad. Yeah. You so, but also first cousins, first cousins, you're allowed to marry. So you're meant to cover up. So basically the rule is you cover up in front of people you can marry. Ah, so, and that's, I've heard, I don't know how true this is. There's a lot of incest that has happened throughout the Middle East. First cousins, yeah, first cousins. Um, Pakistan is, it's a very cultural, a uh, phenomena, but like also thinking about Muhammad's daughter was married to his cousin, his first cousin, Ali. So that's kind of ancestral. 
they're still yeah. first cousins, still genetic line. Um, but it's really funny when a lot of people talk about, you know, atheists have no morality, they believe in incest. And I'm like, hang on, you're we talking as though Muhammad's daughter did not get married in an incestual relationship. Like, yeah. what the hell is going on? And it is so funny how whenever they talk about the morals of Muhammad, they're like, oh, but, you know, Khadija was older than him and he was 25 and she was 40-something, 43, I think. Um, and then I'm like, oh, okay, great. So why does a 50-year-old marry somebody so young, like 20 years later? Why? It's not like she was a widower. It's not like she had kids. It's not like they had kids. It was never for the purposes of them having kids. If God was all knowing, then surely he would know that they're going to have kids. But nope, right. it never happened. Oh, man. So, okay. So okay. This is, this is, there's so much that I'm certain you would be able to come back and like do another recording on some of these more finer details. Cause I really want to get your story and, and, we are really getting into the weeds that I want to do with you on upcoming episodes. If you're available. Um, yeah. So I mean, my story was pretty boring except for the arrest. Not that I would, not that I would ever advocate for going through it again. No, 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 um, no, no, no. But the I work I do is the work I do was pretty interesting. Like the month, the, the, the different grades that I come across people from like the very harsh forced marriage kind of abusive family to like, you know, other people who are like, yeah, you do you or kind of atheist parents or a lot of the Iranians that I've met here, their parents absolutely hate Islam because they were born during the time of, they had to flee their country during the time of the revolution. Mm. Like a lot of the, and I was so surprised because as the like i guess the community i was brought up in being a shia you're kind of devout like you're a devout shia muslim to iranian law like you follow everything that iran does so when iran got the when iran had the revolution and people started wearing hijab it even spread to tanzania as well a few years later because my obviously my parents were born before the iranian revolution and my mom started wearing the hijab when she was 23 I started wearing the hijab when I was eight, and so did my older sister. So something changed between, like, you know, the 15 years that they had, less than 15 years that they had in between. Mm. Um, and it was, in exactly. So, like, when I meet other people, they're like, oh, you don't, like, as an Iranian, you don't, like, not only that you're not a Muslim, but you absolutely hate that religion as well. Um I guess I was I was listening this I was listening to my friend according to her Iranian parents. So I was listening to her talk about her parents and you know, she's like, Yeah, my dad's like a staunch atheist and I'm like, Really? Like being from Iran, like, you know, because it's such a holy land and there's so many events that took place. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Yeah. And it's just like it's like a history flat, like a, like a flashback, like everything that you're told that people should believe in. And it's so devout and close to them. You were just like, well, hang on. Yeah. What am I missing? How have these people not spoken in front of others? And the reality is the reason I got arrested was because I was the person from my community talking about it. They were so threatened of somebody else that I actually had people who would who were so scared of messaging me, even when they were ex-Muslim, but then afterwards, like, you'd even see some Muslims go like, this is fucking crazy. You know what's crazy um, about this? And I really want to do more with you on this stuff. Um, I know some ex-Jehovah's Witnesses who are afraid to speak out, to come out. Uh, they're physically in sometimes, but they're mentally out. They call it PIMO. Um, they might be physically out, and mentally out and still won't speak out about it. Right. So they call that POMO. They have like anachronisms for this, but they're not in any danger or threat. It's more of a social thing and they don't want to lose certain friends or whatever it might be. Uh, they're just afraid with what you're talking about. This is insane. And I can't imagine how many Muslims or people who are in the communities who really think like us about these things but can't they have to just go with the flow and they've kind of psychologically trained themselves to be a muslim even though they just they can't think against it or can't speak 
out and say anything. They're just stuck. Because anything you say is considered blasphemy, and blasphemy is so forbidden on. So even initially when I came out or when I just lived, like I said, it was that long journey. So like, you know, there were times I'm like, do I believe in God? Like I didn't, I didn't know for a very long time, probably a decade. Mm. And when I did, obviously no regrets, but you know, for the longest time, it was that social, it was that social identity that I would be losing if I had spoken about. And I did. I had some of my really, really close friends go like, oh, well, you're not a Muslim anymore. And not yeah. only that, like, you know, like they felt sorry for me. And I'm like, no, don't. I'm, you I'm can, happy. You, you kind of feel sorry, <laughs> like, to be honest. You have to think. And I'm like, you have to think about hell. I don't. I do things because I want to do that because I think that I've made that judgment that it's right. But you have to think about hell. You have to think about so many other things. When I already have, like, found the path that I want to go down and I'm not being a hypocrite. Like, I've had Muslims go like, oh, yeah, but, like, you know, Islam doesn't allow homosexuality. So, like, you know, my gay friends will know what, what you know, they'll go to hell or, you know, they'll talk to God or, you know, maybe I'll pray for them. And I'm like, hang on. Wait, so you're okay with, like, them going to hell and they're your friends. Doesn't that make you, like, a really bad friend? Mm. Um, and they never thought about it. And... Like, I think a lot of people have that social um, fear because I guess not everybody wants to be vocal about it and not all communities would hurt other people for leaving. But a lot of, a lot of different people would definitely be socially ostracized. And yeah, I think that was my case. That why I that's why I was silent for a very long time, um, which was interesting because I remember my friend who was super religious, or you know, she used to like cover up and everything, but she was so liberal and open minded. Like, leave, let the, leave the cover up. But every time we spoke, we felt like we connected and agreed on so much. And then suddenly, when I left Islam, I was you know, she was like, oh, who knows? You might just come back, and I'm like. No, when, once you leave, you don't really, you, you can't really undo it. You can't just go like, oh, I can unsee everything that's wrong in religion now. And once you see it, that's it. So, so let me ask you this. Where, what are you trying to do now? And I know this is a horrible question. Where do you see yourself at in five years questions? Those are horrible. But uh, <laughs> I would like to ask, like, what is your goal and what are you working on right now, if you don't mind? Yeah, so a few things. Um, Tanzania has always been close to my heart, even if I can't go back. But as part of somebody who's always who's always worked in women empowerment, you know, Faith as Ajabi gives me that exercise of my identity being related to the charity itself in many different ways. So one, helping ex-Muslim women. Um, Two, we have a small menstrual health program where we want to work towards educating. Now, this is not related to my activism at all, but it was something that I saw was a very clear um, issue in Tanzania where women don't have access to clean water, let alone sanitary pads. So we're expanding that. But the other thing before I moved to Sweden was to start talking to I guess a lot of the West about ex-Muslims because they don't, you know, they don't really have a program for people who've left religion. You're not recognized. Um, they don't really have other religious denominations that are up for persecution for not being that religious denomination. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about humanitarian visas in Australia, they don't see you being um, at threat if you've left a religion, except for when it comes for, to Islam. I currently work with different orgs, but one of the big one was Amnesty International, who through one of their local chapters sent me a case of a Muslim woman marrying a Christian man. And Islamists were after them. And they're like, these are not the type of cases we handle. And I'm like, what? 
like, what do you mean these are not the type of cases you handle? Like, where is the funding? And I, I was so sad to see that there is still this bigger, wider world where, like, you know, intern, like, you know, we have a lot of atheist orgs, but not enough funding as compared to religious orgs. And these are cases, you know, we have persecuted Christians in Muslim majority countries who have quite a bit of support. But being an atheist is the worst of all sins in Muslim majority countries, especially if you have been a Muslim before. Not because you're a Christian and an atheist. You're, I think you, you're still in a safer zone than being a Muslim and then leaving Islam. And I think that not just awareness piece for the outside world as like Twitter, but in terms of organizations and the support we get, that's where I see myself slowly kind of um, having conversations, talking to refugee councils in terms of like, you know, when people migrate from Saudi Arabia to Australia because they're ex-Muslims, you don't place them with other Saudis who are Muslims or, you know, different other minorities like LGBT Muslims or yeah. LGBT ex Muslims and you don't just place them with one group. So the idea is that I want to see this as like an ongoing project where the podcast and activism is one, the charity has its own little subse subsection of mental health and ex Muslims at risk. But the bigger part is creating that awareness within orgs and setting up structure where they're recognized. It minimizes my work. Um, but it kind of maximizes the bigger um, output and the impact of it. So, you wow. know, there are so many written articles, but a lot of people, like I want to, I want to move beyond just like Twitter activism. I want to go into like this orgs and I have offered to talk to forced marriage units in Australia and I'm like, I don't have to come from like an ex-Muslim point of view, but I can tell you what it's like. Not that I've been subjugated to forced marriage, but I can tell you what it's like, the way people see marriage, the way people see women and how women are raised to shut up about their families. Like in the West, you have this idea where if your parent hits you, you can call 911 or whatever the emergency line is. In Muslim countries and Muslim households, you can't really report your parents. Like, you know, if you think about a sitcom with like uh, brown people versus white people, like you're meant to safeguard your parents. They're always right. You owe them your life. That's how you've been told for a very long time. So you don't just call up social services when you're in trouble. And this is something where I feel like they could do tremendous amount of work, but it's not being reported. We're There's not doing so anything much. state. Yeah. There is nothing in Australia, especially there is nothing happening statewide. And I'm just like, you've had a forced marriage unit since 2015. And how many have you recorded five cases? That's crazy. There are so many more happening. And there's so many more not being reported. What, what you're saying here, I can't imagine how much has not been done and could be. Um, for those of you who are watching, obviously you stuck around and... I hope that if this touched you, go down in the description, check out Zara's, you know, links, see what she has going on there. And if there's any way you want to help, if you know someone who's interested, you guys can help out, be part of this. This will be concluding this first uh, episode with you, just getting your story and stuff. But I think we really have lots of stuff we can get into on the details. So I hope uh, you'll join me again here at Myth Vision, and I hope this video does impact a lot of people who might be questioning and going like, maybe there is a better world. Because I can tell you what you described compared to the life I live, there's this is heaven if you compare them. I agree. You know? So <laughs> if you had one final word, you're speaking to a Muslim right now, um, male or female, it doesn't matter, your choice. What would you say to them right now if they were – actually question, listening to you question everything don't don't type no as an answer and never take somebody's word as an answer be curious this has been my advice to women in engineering as well question everything that's where 
you know, that's where you'll start finding out whether you, even if you decide to be a Muslim in the end because you believe in God, I do not care, provided you don't hurt anybody else, but you're also questioning and being rational in your decisions because I know spiritual Muslims and I know what it's like and how different that is from people who believe in the dogma and have had their lives revolve around it. Mm. Uh, because they're so scared. Actually, the police officer who was investigating asked me why I left Islam. And I'm like, because I read the book. And I was like, what, are you still a Muslim? Have you never thought about reading the book? And he was pretty much like, I can't question it. I get sinned for it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, then don't ask me a question because I will throw the verses at you and you have no idea what I'm saying. But yeah, I would. I feel like there was definitely this punishment in our heads where we don't question things, right. and it's probably our worst enemy, if anything. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Zara K, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate this. I am ready to bring the scalpel to Islam. I want to see the good, the bad, the ugly. I want to analyze these things. So if you're watching this far, hit the like button, make sure you subscribe, share the content, let someone else know who needs to see this. If you're a Muslim watching this, maybe you'll learn a thing or two from us because I know that you always want us to learn about you and the truth of Allah and his prophet and this and that. Well, I'm going to have some scholars on, critical scholars, and we're going to be taking a deep dive into the literature. So be staying tuned. Thank you so much, Zara. Until next time, I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you've lost your identity and you don't know who you are, you can join us. We are Myth Vision. (laughs) 